everyone. Uh, let's get started with where we kind of left off. Let me make sure also I'm not muted, otherwise the recording will be terrible. It's okay. All right, so uh, last time we were talking about sequence-to-sequence -sequence approaches for machine translation, and today I will go over it uh, again, just to give you a quick uh, recap. Um, okay, guys, please, uh, let's, let's uh, focus on this uh, for now. So if we are doing machine translation with a neural approach, we are doing so-called sequence-to-sequence approach. We start with our data and we set this part, this is called parallel data or bypass data. And um, meaning we have our source sequence and we have our target sequence. Here, I already tokenize my sequences to be a list of tokens. Uh, however, when you download the actual data, you will be getting strings with uh, source and targets. And you will need to choose a tokenizer that you like. Uh, for now, let's continue kind of thinking about wor uh, word tokenizer because we have introduced word embeddings that were done on a word level. So for each word, we had an embedding and we didn't talk about how to reach word embeddings with a subword tokenization. So here, each one of these is a, is a word. I selected a word tokenizer and remember that once you have a tokenizer, you have also created a vocabulary because you are going to apply either that tokenizer is like BP is going to learn the vocabulary from the data, or you are going to use something like workspace tokenizer and every possible word in your, uh, in your data is going to be uh, your vocabulary. Um, okay, and here when we deal with uh, these uh, tasks where we have two languages, uh, have in mind that for your vocabulary will be, be composed of tokens or words that are also language uh, specific. Okay, um, so that's first thing. We start with our parallel data. Our goal is to, we are doing supervised machine learning. So we have this data, we have human written uh, translations, and we want to maximize the likelihood of generating something like that. So our goal in training is to maximize the log probability of reference translations given the source sequences. Um, one, uh, two extra details before we start is that if you are using uh, an approach with the recurrent neural networks, we will need to kind of consider what is the hidden representation of a history. And initially we don't have it. So we start with uh, something which is like a zero vector. And we will also need uh, for decoding start and end tokens. This signals please start decoding text. And you want to append uh, end, uh, ending token to the end of your sequences because otherwise your model might just keep generating, generating, generating. And you can artificially set to make it stop after, let's say, 50 tokens. But it might be in the middle of a sentence and you have this arbitrary cutoff. If you have the end of uh, sequence token, in this way, you're signaling to the model, it should kind of stop generating. Um, and you might think, okay, can I use a period? This won't work because you might be generating multi -sent multiple sentences, such as in, if you are doing summarization. Okay, so let's go over all the, all the equations and everything. Um, so we start with the target, excuse me, source sentence, for example, how are you? And we want to generate a translation, let's say in Croatian. Uh, I denoted each one of the tokens in the source uh, sequence with uh, S and a, a corresponding subscript. The first operation we said we are gonna do is gonna embed each one of these tokens with the vector. So we are mapping a token. Um, I should have written here actual index. So here you have, uh, let me write it like this. Um, here there is another step, which is turning this token into vocabulary ID, right? And, and depending on what the ID of this token in the vocabulary is, uh, in the vocabulary is, you are going to retrieve the corresponding row in the big embedding matrix, right? So that's what we do. We find the embedding of each one of these tokens. And then we are doing our sequence of operations, which is basically linear transformation and then uh, applying nonlinearity. 
Unlike with feedforward neural networks, which would just linearly transform the embedding, we have additional uh, operation here to take whatever is our current hidden representation of the history and linearly transform it to then add this to linear transformation. Two details. Uh, some of you last time asked me, I was calling this V, and I accidentally overloaded this matrix symbol to mean both vocabulary and a weight matrix. So now I change it to BW2 just to alleviate this confusion. But yes, this Two matrices here are your weight matrices, and they are initially uh, randomly initialized, right? And then later we are going to do back propagation and we are going to be changing this. So at the end, remind me that we go over this. Um, what are the weights here? We are going to write all the symbols corresponding to uh, weights that we are learning. Um, Okay, so we do the linear transformation of the embedding of the current token plus uh, linear transformation of the hidden uh, history of the uh, hidden representation of the history, which is uh, right now zero because we have no history. We are at the, our first token in a source sequence, and then uh, corresponding. Uh, I'm I'm ignoring the bias now for simplicity. Uh, the linear transformation is then non-linearly uh, transformed, right? Because we are dealing with neural networks. We are always going to have some non-linearity. And then we move to the, to the next token. We repeat these operations. When we come to the last token in our source, see, these equations are the same, except that now we are embedding, of course, the uh, fourth token in our uh, source sequence. And um, this is also here. Excuse me, let me just fix one thing. I don't know why this going to be three here. It's still the same weight matrix. All right, so our history is now the hidden representation from the previous state. And remember, because we do this recursively, this representation also includes the hidden representation of what happened two steps ago and what happened two steps ago includes information that happened three steps ago. So this this uh, this hidden representation here, um, uh, excuse me, there is another mistake. I don't know why there are so many mistakes here. It should be from the previous one, right? Like if we are calculating the uh, hidden representation at the fourth position, then we are looking at what was the hidden state previously. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so when we are done, this hidden representation here is in theory capturing the entirety of this sequence because we have these operations where we keep using the history, right? So in theory, this vector over here should be what we say encoding of the entire source sequence. So now when we move to decoding, uh, we are basically doing the same operations, except that now our history is not a zero vector anymore because now we actually have some history and it is whatever we have seen in the source sequence. So when we, try, when we start uh, making a hidden representation of our started decoding token, here, we, as always, we are going to linearly transform the embedding of that token. But then here, we are going to take uh, our um, previous hidden representation is going to be initialized with the last hidden representation at the source sequence. So basically, we are starting from what we know about source sequence, and then we are starting uh, to uh, decode. One more thing has changed here. So see how I'm using in subscript either E or D, which stands for either encoder or decoder. Uh, this means that I'm signaling that this is not the same matrix W1, meaning that I'm now including new set of weights for decoding. Um, if with these uh, two, in principle, they could be the same. Uh, nothing prevents you to implement it like that. And then we would say we are sharing the weights. In practice, um, I don't know when was the last time I have seen this, which probably means that someone had tried it to save parameters, but it doesn't work. So you do need this extra 
extra weights, extra parameters for doing this, all of this uh, more, uh, you know, better. Remember the weights are, I like the analogy with uh, polynomials and the degree of polynomials, more parameters you have, the more complex decision boundaries you can be learning. And this is basically when I say, okay, sharing these weights wasn't sufficient, that likely means that in theory, actual what's in the background of all of this, it was not sufficient to have only these parameters to learn decision boundaries that we need. Yeah. Not sure, doesn't really matter. You can do it or not. Um, I don't think you do it. Uh, so I think uh, when you're in your first uh, first uh, layer, you will just use the embeddings as they are. And then uh, when you, this is just an example of one um, one layer, one, like your neural network is, is one layer deep. Now, if we would like to make it deeper, which we usually want, then here, for example, this would be the input to the next sequence of transformations, which is itself a nonlinear transformation. I personally have seen this kind of sequence, like embedding, then transformation, then in the next uh, in next layers you give the nonlinear representations. I haven't seen applying nonlinearities directly to embeddings, but again, nothing prevents you from doing that. It's a modeling choice you can be trying. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's possible. Um, okay, so I want to emphasize where, where, where am I? Uh, did I stop here? I was talking about this part, I guess. I completely lost the track of my thoughts. So if I start repeating myself, well, there we go. Um, so here, um, I didn't talk ab about what we are doing once we do the nonlinear transformations, right? Like. Uh, I, I guess I start by saying we have a new set of uh, weights uh, here. Uh, once, unlike in decoder, in, in excuse me, encoder, where you're just trying to encode, make a representation of a source sequence, in decoder we need extra operations to actually decode words from these hidden representations. So up to here, everything kind of stays uh, stays uh, the same more or less. I will make a few lines. So here, not much has changed in when we switch from encoders to decoders, but now at each decoder step, you need to predict a token. And how we do that, we know, okay, we should be first projecting our hidden representation of what we know so far uh, into, the vector of the size of the vocabulary, which we'll do by using this matrix of, uh, of uh, this size, where V is now a vocabulary and this denotes the size of the vocabulary. And uh, when we apply softmax to V dimensional vector, we are going to get again V dimensional vector. And now this vector presents something that has a notion again of probability distribution over vocabulary, from which we can decode. So far, I have told you only a single way of decoding, which is pick the most likely word, the one with the highest probability. So keep thinking about it, but very soon we'll see different ways. We know that there are multiple ways to express yourself in language. So the concept of most probable one, it's not always the best idea, but for now, just think about decoding here being the argmax of this uh, probability distribution. And maybe the word, Kako in Croatian has been the word that's most probable one. And the next step is then to go to your next decoding step. And remember I told you I introduced the idea of teacher forcing last time. So you have in during training two possibilities. You either use the word you have actually decoded as the input in the next step, or you use a word that the human translator had written as the word that comes next. So you have these two options. And I told you that initially you want to start with teacher forcing because your model simply won't be good enough. But later to ensure that you have better generalization, you want to mix a little bit of tokens that the model generate with tokens that had appeared with the uh, in human translations. Okay, so this part where we are 
encoding our source sequence, that's encoder. It has its own weights, right? And then we have decoder uh, with uh, its own weights. However, this is all part of a single model. And when we are doing training, everything is done end to end. So here, this is, uh, we can think about this as a classification. We have predicted a certain class here, a certain word out of all the words in the vocabulary, but there is actually one word that a human translator has written. And then that one, you can think about that's the goal, ground truth for uh, this position. It's, it's now a little bit finicky because it's not like so clear cut as in the case of sentiment classification where indeed there was one ground truth. If I, I collectively ask you what is this positive or negative, majority of you would say the same thing. Here, if you speak two languages and I ask you for the translation, which has multiple way of going about it, I might get a lot of variation, but we still, regardless of the potential for having multiple words being next words, we are going to, for training purposes, consider the one that the human translator had written as the gold one, okay? It is not perfect, but it's gonna be the way we train it. And then since uh, now you are kind of thinking about this as classification, everything stays the same as uh, when we did the training with negative log likelihood, you're go still going to do uh, exactly that. Um, yeah, and if you need a reminder by negative log likelihood, we mean what is the probability of the, the, uh, the ground truth uh, under this model? So you would need to find the probability of the word that the human translator has said is the next word and see what the probability of that one is under your model. And you minimize negative log likelihood. Or if you like the cross entropy approach, then you think about your, which I said are the same things because we are dealing with neural networks and logistic regression. With cross entropy, you can think about, okay, I have my one part encoding of my uh, ground truth, which would be a vector where you have all zeros except ones uh, where the token, uh, that's actually the next token is, and then your softmax, and then you plug this into the cross entropy equation. It's the same thing. One other thing that I have mentioned last time is that unlike sentiment classification, where you have just a single loss value for your instance, here you have loss at every decoding step. And what you do is just average those losses to make your final loss, and then you do backpropagation. So the standard thing, you calculate the gradient with respect to all the things uh, in, your, uh, in your model. And this is where the note where I said this is a joint model comes, um, is important. So if I say uh, do the change all the weights with respect to the loss, if this is the first loss, you will go all the way through, through here, change all of the corresponding weights, but then you will go all the way here, all the way here, all the way here, because everything is recursively connected. So the same rule will go all the way from here to the first uh, token in the source. So that's why this, you know, thinking about this as a joint neural network, although it's part of, it has two components uh, is important. Okay, I think that's as much as I wanna say uh, about this. Oh, you didn't remind me or you didn't even have an opportunity. What are the weights here? Um, I wanna, let's see how to do this. So if you, if you know any of the weights we should be training here, can you raise your hand and then tell me what to write? And let's start from left to right. Okay, just again, I'm asking to give me symbols of all, all the things we are going to change with backpropagation. Yes? Exactly, we have W1 and W2E. Anything else, let's see. If we if we consider to uh, fine tune our embeddings, embeddings themselves would be also um, um, 
something we could train or not. I will write E for embedding matrix and put a question mark next to it. Okay, what else? Maybe some are there for diversity. What are the remaining weights? Yes, please. Yeah, with subscript B. Okay. So these are our weights. These are the actual matrices whose values we are tweaking as we are backpropagating and training the model to maximize the probability of the human written translation. Um, now, an exercise I will leave for you for home is to think about if I ask you what the total number of parameters are, you would need to know what the sizes of all of these matrices are. And then you would sum those sizes. So for example, if this one is of the size D2 by D1, the number of parameters contained, the number, the number of numbers in that matrix is D2 by D1. And here as well. So you have two times D2 uh, by D1. Uh, embedding, you will have the size of the vocabulary times D1. So you will sum those numbers too, and so on. Okay, so you check what are the sizes of your matrices, and then you sum all of those, and that makes the total number of parameters. Um, you had a question. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you, very important. We would not learn anything if we didn't have that one. Ah, okay. And, uh, Great, I love that you uh, warned me about this because this is a massive one, right? Like, um, remember how I told you, you can't have arbitrary number of weights, uh, excuse me, number of words, in number of tokens in your vocabulary. Now it's time to think about that again. So if I had 30,000 tokens in the vocabulary and if my dimension is something like 1,000, I have 30,000 by 1,000, numbers I need to store in this matrix alone. And remember, the reason why uh, we care about how much we are storing is for two reasons. One is for all of these numbers relative to the precision we are saving them in will amount to certain memory. And our GPUs are bounded by memory. The largest we have on CHPC are 80 gigabytes. So, and we want to work with models that are, for example, the latest open weights llama is 405 billion parameters, right? So the how much we can actually store on our GPUs is influenced by the number of parameters we have. Um, and the other reason is um, generalization. But if these matrices, the more parameters we need to learn, uh, it's easier to overfit on the training data. Uh, so if you have lots of parameters and lots of data, that can work well. But if you have little data and lots of parameters, that won't work well, and your model will start overfitting. So yeah, this one is very important and makes a huge chunk of our uh, parameters. I sense I saw a hand there. Was it? Okay. I guess someone else have seen uh, the W. Oh. Yes, please. Oh, you are totally right. I can tell you why. I kind of started denoting this as S5. Oops. Because um, here we finished with S4 and then I started to write S5 and I was like, actually, it's going to be mixing source and target token. So uh, that's that's why uh, there was a T5 there. It's just a mistake. Thank you. Okay, I will double check this after the class as well. Oh. Is the encoder working? Is there the same case for even the same case as the data? Uh, input to our coder. The question, what is the input? Is it just a sentence or a source sentence or also a target sentence? Okay, so let, let's go through this. Why would we add a target sequence into the encoder? If not, they follow the encoder when you talk and target 
Yeah, so in the encoder, the encoder is not decoding. So encoder, see how we hear, we don't have the uh, layers responsible for predicting the, the tokens. So the, this part here, it doesn't even involve generations of tokens. All we are doing here is go one token at a time, generate, the, create the hidden representation and move to the next one. So the model here is not encoding anything. So this is just a bunch of matrix computations we do to calculate this vector over here, over here, that will be used to initialize this vector over here. And then only with our decoder component, we start generating. So you can imagine you have two classes. One is encoder, the other is decoder, and your total model, it kind of uses the both of them. Here, you will just have these computations, compute the vector you need, send it to the decoder class, initialize, initialize this state, and then start decoding, yeah. So yeah, you wouldn't add here anything except sort sequence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, and you explain it back to me. Why does it preserve the order? Yeah, I see what might confuse you. Yeah, so you're right that uh, your explanation that, okay, every time we create a hidden representation in a source, we are basically going um, word by word in source and building the hidden representations. And in this way, we are capturing the order because the hidden representation, um, remember that um, example I had um, um, where uh, this, I, I use words like terrible and bad to kind of show the, if you just swap them, you have completely different meaning, but if you scramble the words, you lo lose that. With this approach, you would go and build these hidden representations words by words. So what you get that the final step would be different across these two uh, sentences. The, the actual vector wouldn't be the same, right? And that's the way uh, to think about is the, word order preserved or not. Are you making two uh, exactly same representations for sentences that have exact same words in different order? And if the answer is no, you are modeling the word order, which is the case here. But then you said something interesting, which is by the time we come here, like, are we remembering all of this? And in theory, if you just think about, if you look at this from purely theoretical standpoint, you are. But in practice, people have shown that we do not. And this is basically what we are going to work towards uh, today and next time to see how to better remember at each coding step what was happening uh, here. Yeah. OK, let's move on. We have lots to cover. Okay, so just a recap in words, <laughs> not illustrations. Uh, what we have seen now is an example of so-called conditional text generation or conditional language modeling. In language modeling, pure language model, you just started with decoding. You started with start, uh, start token and you started to generate something. Uh, here, we are conditioning our generation on another sequence. In the case of machine translation, that other sequence is going to be a source sentence, sentence in written uh, in, a, in a language, a particular language like English, and then the target, what we are generating is in another language. Um, there are many cases of uh, how you can, you can approach many weird tasks uh, with uh, conditional text generation. So for example, summarization, where you have a document and you wanna summarize it. Again, your, what you're encoding is the full document and then giving the representation of that full document, you start decoding the summary. Or in a dialogue, you have the previous history, the previous utterances in a dialogue are what you are conditioning the model when it generates its own utterance. 
And uh, so some tasks are naturally these sequence to sequence problems, uh, but some are not. And we have kind of converged as a field of seeing everything as a sequence to sequence, which works really well, but it's really disappointing as well. So for example, the task of syntactic parsing that we'll talk about at the end of this course, where the goal is to produce um, some kind of a tree that represents syntactic structure of a sentence. For example, here it says that you have, in John has a dog, you have a noun phrase, and then you have a verb phrase. Verb phrase is uh, has a dog, which consists of its of a word uh, have and uh, another and noun phrase. So we'll learn about like how to build these trees. The what I'm trying to say here is that we have a tree, and um, and the task is given a sentence to produce a tree, and tree is a nice structure, but we can model the generation of this tree by linearizing it, you see like here, by using this bracketing notation to, to uh, uh, represent this tree. And then uh, you are generating the tree token by token here, you know, bracket S, bracket NP and so on. And this works really well. And this is just one of example where something which is more like a structure prediction and you would like to have very cool algorithms that do something way more involved than just generating next token. Well, it turns out that just generating next token is uh, really powerful. So, but you know, at the time 2014, this was 10 years ago. This is where we started to kind of linearize everything and to do this like next token prediction. And it kind of, when you think about it, it paid off because let's say OpenAI had betted on this uh, approach that, well, we just see everything that is next, next token prediction. We ignore any fancy more, you know, principal algorithms and we scale the model size, we scale uh, the, the data size and we see where we get and where we got is ChatGPT, which is, um, to some may be disappointing, but for many it was very uh, exciting. Okay, um, so what I wanna do next is, uh, I wanna wrap the machine translation part by telling you how do you evaluate machine translation. I'm kind of doing thing, two things while I'm teaching machine translation to you. I'm trying to introduce the machine translation task, the NLP tasks and I'll show you how you can model it and how you evaluate it. At the same time, a lot of what we have seen uh, on this illustration of encoder decoder will be what makes large language models. When we are gonna move into architecture, encoder decoder architecture, that's a little bit more involved and we are still going to do conditional text generation uh, with uh, LLMs. Okay, but first let's wrap machine translation, uh, how, to, how to evaluate it. Uh, there are two things we care about when we evaluate machine translation, that's adequacy and fluency. Um, adequacy basically says, well, whatever the translation is saying should be an adequate representation of the content in the source sequence. Um, so for example, here, um, this uh, original sentence is in Spanish, Avinay le gusta Python, and there are three different translations. One is to Vinay it like Python, kind of adequate, you kind of get, it's not like, as we kind of now hinting on, it's not really fluent, but you kind of get what the source sequence I was trying to say. Like, for example, you know, like when people try to speak to me in Croatian, I will, it will if I understand what they're saying, but it's completely ungrammatical, I'll be like, yeah, that's, that's great. So in that sense, this is an adequate, but not fluent uh, translation. And then we have an example of Vinay debugs memory leaks, which has nothing to do with the what the content of the source sequence uh, was. So this is not adequate, but it is fluent, right? It's a proper sentence in uh, English. And then we have the actual translation that we want, which is Vinay likes Python, which is both adequate and fluent. Um, so this is hard, uh, anything that starts uh, any, any kind of text generation task will pose evaluation challenges. And first thing you could do, and what we still do to this day is uh, not an automatic, but rather a manual evaluation where you hire some translators 
and you ask their judgments of translation quality. So you generate your translations and then you ask them, how do you judge the fluency of this translation? And they rate it from one to five, where five is flawless English and one is incom incomprehensible. And you ask them how much of the meaning expressed in the reference translation is also expressed in the hypothesis translation. And they can say everything from all to none, right? And then for you, maybe you have generated 200 translations across these 200 translations, you would average this course and this, you would say, well, on average, I am my, my, my translation system produces a translation that's five score around score five like a good english um fluent but it's um uh it's adequacy score is only on average two which would mean that your translation system isn't really good another thing you can do is uh doing ranking ranking assessments this is useful if you want to compare two systems uh, for example maybe you are trying to improve a system and you want to say mine is better than the previous one you will hire again uh, translators and show them pairs of translations. You wouldn't tell them which system generating uh, which to not bias these people. And then you ask them preferences. Hey, is one better than the other or they are equally good or bad? And then later you can report, well, this many, this fraction of instances, for this fraction of instances, people have said that my translations are better than the previous system's translations. And if that number is high, like, 60%, like over majority of cases, that, that's good. That means that people prefer uh, yours. Today, it's become fashionable to also use GPT-4 as a judge, where instead of hiring person, you present GPT-4 with two uh, generations, and you uh, ask which one is better. Uh, this is prone to many issues. I recommend checking this paper. Uh, for example, it has been shown that GPT-4 favors, of course, its own generations, it favors longer generations, and so on. So it's not a bulletproof uh, methodology, but none of the automatic evaluations of text generations are. So we still use GPT-4 as a judge, uh, but what's important is to... Um, do something I'll come to a little bit later, which is the, basically uh, you have, um, you should do the this preference situation with uh, humans and they give you some preferences and then you try it also with GPT-4, replacing the human as a judge. And then you check the correlation of preferences between humans and GPT-4. If they are highly correlated, you can say, well, for this particular task, my GPT-4 is uh, okay as a replacement for a human judge, but in research papers, for example, you would, we would always expect to have human evaluation uh, at the end. So yeah, you can use GPT-4 as a judge. It's a good way to develop your systems, you know, because doing human evaluation at every single iteration of development is really costly and really slow. This helps you kind of to move forward. But at the end, when you're done, when you think you have something that's better than whatever is before, then you need to do human evaluation. Another uh, very uh, important, um, uh, sorry guys, this, I should have added animation here. Um, one very uh, you know, important measurement for uh, machine translation is, uh, is a blue score, which has you know, over 20, 20 years old, still used to this day, but we'll see it has many issues. But uh, the principle behind blue score is to measure, well, if I have my generated uh, translation and if I have human translation, can't I check how much these translations overlap? And if there is a high overlap, isn't that indicative of, well, my generated translation is similar to a human translation and therefore it's good, right? That's the basis behind blue score. And this is an example of what you call a lexical overlap measurement, where you check whether the words in the two, gen, you know, two translations actually overlap. It is based on engram precision. You check amongst engrams appearing in your hypothesis translation, so the one your model had generated, how many of them also appear uh, in the human translation. So you check the precision of your um, translation. And you do this for various sizes of N, I think common is one, two, three, four. 
And then you use the uh, geometric mean of the precisions for different uh, engram sizes. Uh, there are a few details you need to take care of. Um, you need to avoid the logarithm of zero, of course, otherwise you will get exploding things. Uh, you also don't want to be, if, you're, if your generation is just repeating a single word, um, then uh, you want to um, use an engram uh, only once. Uh, if it appears multiple times, you will use it only once for uh, calculating uh, these uh, numbers. And reason is to kind of uh, demote this, um, basically penalize repeating the engrams, which was a very, very, very common issue before, let's say, 2020. We had, like, you can't believe how bad that generation is. It was so, so bad. We would just generate these words like two, 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 or the, 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 a, 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 and even in the like top tier <laughs> research papers. So we tried everything to avoid that. And then uh, this, um, this can also, um, you can get uh, arbitrarily high precision just because your translation is really short. So uh, there is something called brevity penalty, which is uh, applied to the, uh, this uh, geometric mean. You will never implement blue yourself. You are always going to use reference uh, implementation. There is about a million ways to mess it. So this is how it looks like, but do not go about implementing yourself. Use whatever is the package that people are using. And even those have been shown to having a lot of bugs, I guess up currently they are the cleanest versions of themselves, but don't try to implement these things because it's it's messy. Um, here is just an example of like what we are doing with P1 to P4. So uh, calculating precisions at uh, different uh, engrams, adding the brevity penalty. For example, this one is shorter and that gives you uh, the final blue. And you can see how it can become um, here we have our kind of larger blue score than for uh, Vinay likes Python, which is not good, right? Because Vinay likes programming in his uh, pajamas is uh, different from the reference translation, which Vinay likes programming in Python. So it's, it's finicky. And uh, it's finicky to the point that people have written so many papers about how blue is not a good measurement for the evaluation. Uh, so again, if you hire some people and they give you the measurement of, let's say, adequacy, and then you get for each one of your translations a certain score, if your automatic measurement is a good replacement for human judgments, then the scores you are getting from people and the scores you are getting from the automated measure should correlate. And people keep showing that despite the community using the blue scores, they do not correlate with what we actually care about. So people will say blue correlates correlate with human judgments. They are blind to most of the valid translations, exploit multiple references, unsuitable to evaluate short text, sensitive to tokenization, unsuitable for evaluating translation of high quality, lacks interpretability, overestimates adequacy, lacks discriminative power, exhibit technological biases, tied to poor scientific credibility, is unsuitable outside of the machine translation evaluation. So point is, it has a lot of issues, but it's still commonly used in the in research. So it's one of these paradoxes I cannot explain you. It's just that there is this measurement. People have been using it for the last 20 years. It's well documented that it doesn't work super well, but it just, there isn't anything better. And doing human evaluation all the time doesn't work. Like in, in the ethos of the NLP community, it's like too slow and uh, people have no patience for it. So what I want you to remember is that there is the continuous quest for reliable automatic evaluation of machine translation and other text generation. Uh, there is, for example, last year and every year there is a shared task uh, that examines uh, automatic evaluation uh, metrics for machine translation. Like people are still looking for the way to do automatic evaluation properly. Today, more often than just using BERT, we will use so-called learn uh, metrics. And you, the way you can think about them, 
is to get the representation of your translation and get the representation of your human uh, translation, put them in some vector space, and then you want the, um, if, if your translation was good, the generated one, if you take, for example, dot products between these vectors, you want to get a high dot product if that's a good measurement. And you can kind of train models to do that using this uh, data where people have actually provided scores for the translations. So there is a whole line of work where people do that. To actually understand that, we need to learn a few more things. So we'll come back to this, uh, how to do the, um, how to learn these metrics and have better automatic metrics for uh, text generation evaluation later when we talk about summarization because we need to go over pre-trained models to be able to cover that. Okay, so questions about translation evaluation. Another thing that's important for me to remember is now start to make mapping in your head between sentiment classification, accuracy of one score, language modeling, uh, perplexity, which is basically a function of load likelihood of the data, uh, machine translation, automatic measurement blue, but human judgments are more reliable. Like you need to now start mapping tasks to the evaluation measurements people are using. Uh, don't get mixed up in thinking, oh, now I can just use accuracy the way I use it for sentiment classification to evaluate translation system. That's not gonna work. And this is important, you know, once you, if you land a job in NLP, you're, you should know how to evaluate whatever your task to evaluate. So uh, start, start mapping these things uh, in your head. Okay, so this is about translation. And what I'll talk about next it still was done a lot in the context of machine translation. Remember, like this era around 2017 is where a lot of these things were done by machine uh, translation researchers. But now, whatever we are going to talk about next, this the decoding strategies and attention, that becomes relevant for uh, many, many tasks if they are if you are approaching all of these tasks with conditional text generation. And you can approach most tasks as conditional uh, text generation. For example, classification, you can generate a label, positive, negative, right? No one stops you from doing that. And this is kind of what happened. And this is why now everything is kind of generative. Uh, when, you know, think about ChatGPT, all you are getting are generations. So, yeah, maybe it might be a little bit confusing if I talk, continue talking about translation, but from now, everything becomes more general. You can think about it not relevant just for machine translation, but for uh, large language models, which in turn can be used for many, many things. Okay, so for example, decoding strategy. Um, so far, I have shown you only one example of how to actually decode the token from the probability distribution over the vocabulary, which was pick the most probable token for in the softmax vector, right? That, that was what I was doing uh, so far. Any ideas how this might go wrong? Yes. Uh, maybe the most likely words are often words like the and mm -hmm. uh, so you kind of have a gibberish sentence that mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah, definitely. So there is a what you're referring to is the issue of repetition. It we are constantly repeating the same word, and you're totally right, as I told just a second ago. We had this issue where we would just repeat a single word. You wouldn't get a coherent uh, sentence. So that's uh, that's a definitely an issue that uh, might appear. Um, another issue is that um, you know this is a greedy uh, greedy uh, approach, and you know a lot of you are computer science majors, so you know how greedy approaches can uh, fail. In this specific scenario, you could miss. Um, high probability tokens that will would appear later, but they are now hidden uh, behind, you know, um, 
th that would be generated in the next step, but in the current step, they are um, uh, kind of hidden behind the low probability token. So what I mean by that, uh, let me see, um, where is there an example of this? Okay, so here, for example, um, we have the nice woman and here nice is the uh, the highest probable one. Um, but when you look at this other path, the dog has, we see that has here has very high probability, but it's kind of blocked by the fact that the dog had lo lower probability than nice. So what can happen is that, um, you can imagine that this path has high probabilities and actually the joint probability of that whole sequence is higher than anything else. But if in the beginning we start, it, um, one of the tokens have lower probability than any of the other ones, then we will never come to that path. And an easy way to kind of go about this is to not consider only a single path, but multiple. So this is a this is called beam uh, search, where instead of just keeping the most probable word, you keep uh, a few of them, and uh, that number is called the number of beams. So, for example, instead of re just um, recording the top uh, the top probable word, you record what are the top three uh, most probable words. So your number of beams would be three. Okay. So you do that at every decoding step, and then you will end up with a bunch of possible sequences to generate, right? And uh, again, we can generate the, we can calculate the joint probability of a sequence by making a product of probabilities, right? So for each one of these multiple sequences we have um, generated, we know what is the, the probability of that sequence, and we can provide to the user the most probable one. Okay, so instead of a single one, we check a bunch of potential sequences and we check, uh, we retrieve the most, uh, most probable one. The issue is still with the uh, repetitions. Um, the problem is not really handled uh, by that because uh, if you had it, you know, uh, as you mentioned, the, the function words or stuff words being the ones that get a lot of probability mass, you might end up with these uh, the, the, the situations, uh, again, being, you know, the most probable sequence. And uh, what people have also done are so-called engram penalties, where um, you forbid that engram can appear twice in your generation. What this means is when you are, you have your uh, probability distribution, you will set certain words to zero, their probability to zero, to forbid the model to ever having an option to generate those. This is also not uh, not great. Can you give me an example of like where this would be a terrible idea? Like where uh, forbidding to generate an engram would be really not good. If you wanted to write poetry, for a song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in song we have chorus, which is usually repeated. Why wouldn't we repeat this, you know, to, to lyrics, right? Any other ideas? Yeah, exactly. Entities. Um, if I write a guide about New York City, I'm going to repeat New York City a couple of times, right? It's a, it's a completely reasonable thing to do. So, in many text generation tasks, this is not maybe for machine translation where we generate where we need to translate very short sequences. Yeah, this this might work well because there isn't many engrams that are being repeated. But for many legit text generation tasks, you are going to be repeating things. Okay. Um, also, high quality human language does not follow a distribution of high probability next words. We are, yes, we extended the idea to include top, uh, you know, three uh, probable words, but we are still following what are the most probable words. And this is not how we as humans generate text. And if you want something like chatbot, like ChatGPT, you might not want to do that either. 
Uh, this is an example of, this is an, a figure that illustrates here uh, what, what I'm talking about here. So under some language model, I don't know which one specifically, uh, these uh, authors had um, examined the probability of the token that's selected by Beam search and probability of a token that actual human written text um, that tokens in a human written, you know, associated text have. So for example, if this was a uh, translation, here we would check the probability of the translated tokens under our language models. And here we would check the probability of uh, tokens that are in human translation under the same uh, language model that gives us these probabilities. And what you can see here that yes, humans sometimes pick these highly probable words, but we also pick some really low probability words. We have this more surprise in a way. And uh, in early ages of uh, GPT-3, people were trying to show that the text is generated by GPT by showing these likelihoods. And if you've seen a lot of like color-wise, if you put um, low probability in lighter color and higher probability in more intense color, you would see that human text had a lot of colors where generated text were kind of uniforms color-wise. And this was one helpful tool. Since then, um, detecting generated text had become way more complicated. Okay, so we want to kind of have um, something like this. So I have a little bit of more variation in not always predict the most probable uh, words. So we might want to sample from our uh, distribution uh, again, where we are sampling from is that softmax vector of the size of the vocabulary. So you could just randomly sample a token. And of course, this is not gonna work nicely if we are just uniformly sampling, right? Because I mean, probabilities do matter to, to, uh, to actually be able to generate text that's not uh, gibberish. So if something had really low probability, our language model um, uh, probably shouldn't be doing that. However, uh, we could do what's called uh, temperature scaling, uh, where we can um, either soften or sharpen the probability. So we can uh, increase the likelihood of high uh, probability words and decrease the uh, likelihood of low probability words. So um, the the idea is here is to, if um, if some of these are reasonable, but never likely under our model, we can sharpen, uh, we can uh, soften these probabilities such that these lose some probability mass and some is given to this one. Uh, or for example, here, the probability distribution is really sharp, so we can soften it. And all you're doing in your softmax equation is dividing, um, the, the uh, hidden representation by this temperature uh, factor. The temperature, the higher it is, more soften uh, probabilities will be more uniform and lower the T is, is gonna sharpen the probabilities. This is also not great because still, we don't wanna really sample for the, from the, from the entire distribution. So you might say, well, okay, how about we pick some K and we pick only top K words and fix those and then sample randomly for the, from those. Then we are going to discard words that are very low probability and we just need to take care of, you know, just sample from the, the ones that are likely. And this is a good idea. Um, however, it is, the issue here is that doesn't care, um, how distributions look like across different instances. So again, you can have pretty pretty flat distribution like this one, or you can have pretty sharp distribution like this one. And if I take the top, uh, how many, six here, um, and I sample from these, um, these over here that have less probability are gonna appear frequently because their probability is not, ridiculously lower than this one. This one will still be sampled more frequently, but these other ones have a chance, right? Unlike here, where we also took to top six, but 
this probability over here is way higher than this one here. So the word A is gonna be very, very rarely sampled and the word drives is gonna be oversampled. So we need to dynamically change what the K is gonna be depending on how these distributions look like at a given moment. Are they sharp? Are they flat? And this is achieved with so-called top B or nucleus sampling used to this day, where you are going to choose um, P such that you sample from the smallest possible set of tokens whose cumulative probability exceeds the probability P. So here, for example, if you set your um, uh, P value to be a uh, point, uh, let's say 96, it turns out you can choose these three to uh, get the probability mass of 0 0.97. Whereas here you need to sh uh, pick one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine words to get the probability mass of 0 0.94. So you see, depending on whether it's flat or uh, sharp, you can find the number of words that will give you the certain uh, cumulative uh, probability mass. And then depending on which one you get, you sample from those. So if you have flat distribution, you're going to sample, you have more options to sample from. Whereas here you will end up with very few, but probable words. They, here you discarded A, which is super rare and doesn't stand a chance. So uh, when you are sampling from just three words, these are gonna have more, more chance to appear. Okay, so that's basically it. Like today, um, you will see many other decoding strategies to achieve certain behaviors. Uh, for example, O1, uh, the newest OpenAI's model had been released uh, recently and they have extra strategies for let's say reasoning, uh, but everyone will be using top P. And another thing to have in mind is that now with sampling, uh, you might have the same text you are conditioning on, but due to sampling, you will have different outputs. So if you have observed, let's say, ChatGPT, you give it the same prompt, it gives you back different responses. This is why, because in the backbone, there is a sampling strategy. So the model is sampling from the distribution. And if you want to have always the same answer, you need to set top P and other values, uh, top P, top K, everything that needs to be set to achieve greedy decoding where you are always going to pick the most probable uh, one. So if you need that, you need to tweak these hyperparameters and then you can uh, do it. Yes. Do you do the top P, do you also do the system or do I want to do it? Yeah, so when you use these libraries, you will have all of these uh, options, uh, temperature, top K and top B. Um, so let's go, I know we are kind of tweaking all of them in practice, but I do wanna think about what are the effects of um, changing each one of them. So with temperature scaling, if you first apply temperature scaling, you can, for example, flatten this one out. And now your when you do top P, how many you get from the distribution will change. So yes, you can use temperature together with top P, they are serving different functions, right? Um, top K, that whether, I feel like once you have top P, you don't need top K uh, anymore. I don't see what additional change uh, it would give you unless, um, unless we pick top K, we resample it to have the sum of them being one, and then we can apply top P again. That would be an option. So if you just taken top K here, uh, the sum of these won't be one, but you can take top K, do some rims, uh, you know, recalculations, like you can apply, it, put it back into softmax, for example, and it will give you a distribution new distribution where you just care about these and then 
even in that distribution, you can think about, you know, take top P with different values of P. But I'm now when I say it, I don't know for which exact purpose that would serve. So all of these, you can combine them together to have certain behaviors. Um, I think I see in temperature and top P are the, you know, when I talk to my students, they're like, oh, okay, we are changing these hypermarket meters. I will hear those two, but I don't hear top K being mentioned. Uh, so I, I think it's um, not necessary once you have top, a, top B. Yeah. Yep. Okay, let's think about this. Uh, with top P, you select the ones whose cumulative ma probability mass is certain value. Um, and then with, uh, with temperature, you can flatten it or sharpen it if you like, and then sample from it. Um, maybe, I can't think of an example from the top of my head where this would be helpful. Um, but again, like nothing prevents you from doing that, right? Like it's, as I just uh, said out loud. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can't think of an example, sorry. Okay, I recommend that you also check this blog post by Hugging Face, how to generate. They have a bunch of these uh, visualizations and explanations of these different decoding strategies together with the how when you hold certain hugging face functions, which we will eventually do, how you just set these uh, hyperparameters. Uh, you can see a little bit of that. Okay, so decoding covered. We have seen different ways to decode. Uh, now we're going to go back to um, one thing we have mentioned is the issue with our um, RNN deco encoder decoder, which is um, we assume that that vector, we have produced the hidden vector at the final token in our source sequence. In theory, should remember everything that had happened in our source sequence, it is encoded there, and our decoder has access to all the information it needs. In theory, yes, that could happen. In practice, that doesn't really happen. There is uh, something like forgetting a little bit of information uh, when we start decoding that information that's encoded in that hidden representation, that's initial state, doesn't capture everything uh, we need. To circumvent that, we are going to introduce attention mechanism as it was defined for encoder decoder with RNNs. And then we are going to encode, uh, extend it to something called self-attention. And self-attention is going to be the main, most important component of the transformer architecture. And then we are going to see the rest of the uh, transformer. Once we cover transformer, then we are going to talk about how to pre-train it, how to fine tune it, how to train it for many, many tasks. And then we will come to an era of ChatGPT with uh, where you can prompt it and do all sorts of things. So now with this, we are basically covering, starting to cover key ingredients of large language models. Once I'm done with the, once I start talking about self-attention, that's when we start to talk about key ingredients of LLMs. It's no longer about the background that we need for it. Okay, so going back to this illustration, uh, so this is what we started with uh, today's lecture. We had our encoder encoding a source sequence. We have our decoder. And uh, I have said that we have a hidden state here where this hidden representation is um, should in theory encode all information that is present in the source sequence such that the decoder can make right decisions about decoding. And this turned out to be, uh, be a bottleneck, especially when the source sequence is really long. It becomes, uh, we are trying to cram everything we know about this very long sequence into this single uh, vector, which turned out to be too inefficient. There wasn't enough capacity in that single vector to capture all that information. 
Okay, and then to circumvent that problem, researchers in 2015 have introduced an attention mechanism. It provides solution to this bottleneck problem that everything has to be in this one hidden uh, representation. One of the core seminal papers in machine, trans, uh, machine learning and NLP, Neural Machine Translation by Joint Learning to Align and Translate, is where this was proposed. And this is kind of shows you this connection between neural machine translation and then transformers. So attention was proposed as a, as a way to do translation better with these sequence to sequence models. And then it was extended to, to make the most important architecture, neural architecture to this day. The, I will give you an overview of this idea in, on this slide, then we'll go over the illustration. The idea is that on the each decoder step, we use kind of like a connection to each encoder step, to each encoder token, more specifically to the represent, hidden representation of uh, each um, source token or encoder, uh, excuse me. I'm kind of swapping between source and encoder and confusing myself. So. At the each decoder step, you are basically going back to the each encoder step. And it, you give the ability to decoder to re-examine which source tokens are important for that decoding step. Mathematically, what this is, you have your decoder hidden state. I'm sorry, I'm now using different notation because I'm reusing the slides from the last time I was teaching this. So here, this is the hidden uh, representation at the time step t. Okay, so this is relu of the two linear uh, of the sum of two linear transformations we have seen uh, today. And when I say you go back to the encoder steps and re-examine, what I mean mathematically is that you do a dot product between a hidden representation at each encoder step and your current decoder hidden representation. So you do dot products. Remember dot products for us are always kind of your similarity of things. We kind of uh, use it as a proxy for importance. So basically by doing dot product of this uh, hidden representation as the first encoder step and our current decoder representation, you are measuring how important is the first source token to this decoding step. And you do that for every single one of your encoders uh, steps, right? You are interested in their importance of each one of them. Now, because we like values from zero and one, because it's easier to interpret them, we are gonna put these values, four values in a vector. And how are we gonna squish them to be zero, to in between zero and one? Which functions are we gonna use? Oh my God, you're so quiet. Softmax, yeah. Again, you need to be confident. So softmax is what's gonna be used here. It's a, we give it the vector of value and it spits out the vector of, um, of values between zero and one. So for example, here, it might be the case that for the first decoder step, it's really important to focus attention to the first uh, source token, which makes sense, right? You're just starting to decode. So most likely you are going to kind of start if you are in the case of machine translation, directly translating that uh, first uh, word. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, equation of what we have just said to do. We put our uh, attention scores into a vector. Remember each one of these is dot product of the hidden representation at the encoder step with the current decoder step, with the hidden representation of the current decoder step. We put it into a softmax and we get something that's like a distribution, probability distribution or importance distribution. We can say that, yes, this token is way more important than these other ones. Okay, what to do now with this is to create a hidden representation of your entire source sequence where you consider this information that more information about the first token should be captured than about other tokens, because the first token is more important. Mathematically, how you do that is you take the average, uh, you take the uh, weighted sum 
of the encoder hidden states where weights are determined by attention scores, okay? So each one of these is going to be a number between zero and one, and higher that number is, more important the hidden state is, and then you take each one of these, um, you know, you, you average them, but you take these weights into account. Is that clear? Is this equation clear? Any doubts? Okay, so great. Now what we have done is for a given decoder step, we have produced a representation of a source sequence where the information about which token in the source sequence are important for this decoder step is taken into account. And now um, we are going to do the following thing. We are going to concatenate uh, these, this vector of the representing the source uh, source sequence, but tailored to the given decoder step uh, together, together with the hidden state that we have computed the way we have computed it before. So what we are doing is we are enriching that hidden representation. We have cal calculated in our st standard way just by combining the, the previous uh, state with the current uh, linear transformation of embedding and apply relu. You concatenate them and you get a richer uh, representation and everything st else stays the same except that your output layer is now needs in that matrix, which is of the size of the number of words in the vocabulary times some dimensionality. It's now that dimensionality is times two times larger. Okay, and you're gonna repeat this for every single decoding step, right? Like for every decoder step, uh, you might get different distribution of which source tokens are important. So you are, for every one of them, you are creating a tailored source uh, representation. And this turned out to be really important to get good text gener conditional text generation abilities. Um, it was one of the very, very, very big uh, advances. So it solved the bottleneck uh, problem for us and in this way improved neural machine translation performance. Um, didn't talk much about this, but this also uh, had help with the vanishing gradient problems where your gradient became zeros. It also provides some interpretability because now these attention scores we have calculated can be used uh, to visualize the connection between the uh, each source token's importance to the target uh, token uh, to, to the target token. So you get these kind of uh, heat maps. There is a they are kind of overused sometimes because uh, they can also be finicky. I teach explainability course. I link here if you are interested to see failed whole lectures on how these visualizations can uh, can fail, but they are provide some, to some extent, some level of uh, interpretability. Just don't think about it as a perfect interpretability, like this is the reason why you generated this uh, translation, but it does offer some inspection of what's going on. Okay, we are gonna stop here, and then we are going to extend this idea a little bit further and start going into the transformers.